Hi everyone, this is Robert. Welcome to The Well Told Tale. Every week we bring you the finest science fiction and fantasy stories ever written. Today we return to The Trial by Franz Kafka. Things are starting to look a bit grim for Kay, and he is running out of options as to who to trust. Where will he turn to next? It's time to pull up a chair, relax and enjoy part eight of The Trial by Franz Kafka. There was no choice but to take his representation away from the lawyer very soon, at best that very evening. The lawyer had told him, as he talked to him, that that was something unheard of and would probably do him a great deal of harm, but Kay could not tolerate any impediments to his efforts where his trial was concerned, and these impediments were probably caused by the lawyer himself. But once he had shaken off the lawyer, the documents would need to be submitted straight away, and if possible, he would need to see to it that they were being dealt with every day. It would, of course, not be enough, if that was to be done, for Kay to sit in the corridor with his hat under the bench like the others. Day after day, he himself, or one of the women, or somebody else on his behalf, would have to run after the officials and force them to sit at their desks and study Kay's documents instead of looking out on the corridor through the grating. There could be no let-up in these efforts. Everything would need to be organised and supervised. It was about time that the court came up against a defendant who knew how to defend and make use of his rights. But when Kay had the confidence to try and do all this, the difficulty of composing the documents was too much for him. Earlier, just a week or so before, he could only have felt shame at the thought of being made to write out such documents himself. It had never entered his head that the task could also be difficult. He remembered one morning when, already piled up with work, he suddenly shoved everything to one side and took a pad of paper on which he sketched out some of his thoughts on how documents of this sort should proceed. Perhaps he would offer them to that slow-witted lawyer, but just then the door of the manager's office opened and the deputy director entered the room with a loud laugh. Kay was very embarrassed, although the deputy director, of course, was not laughing at Kay's documents, which he knew nothing about, but at a joke he had just heard about the stock exchange, a joke which needed an illustration if it was to be understood, and now the deputy director leant over Kay's desk, took his pencil from his hand and drew the illustration on the writing pad that Kay had intended for his ideas about his case. Kay now had no more thoughts of shame. The documents had to be prepared and submitted. If, as was very likely, he could find no time to do it in the office, he would have to do it at home at night. If the nights weren't enough he would have to take a holiday. Above all, he could not stop halfway. That was nonsense. Not only in business, but always and everywhere. Needless to say, the documents would mean an almost endless amount of work. It was easy to come to the belief, not only for those of an anxious disposition, that it was impossible ever to finish it. This was not because of laziness or deceit, which were the only things that might have hindered the lawyer in preparing it, but because he did not know what the charge was, or even what consequences it might bring, so that he had to remember every tiny action and event from the whole of his life, looking at them from all sides and checking and reconsidering them. It was also a very disheartening job. It would have been more suitable as a way of passing the long days after he had retired and become senile, but now, just when Kay needed to apply all his thoughts to his work, when he was still rising and already posed a threat to the deputy director, when every hour passed so quickly and he wanted to enjoy the brief evenings and nights as a young man, this was the time he had to start working out these documents. Once more, he began to feel resentment. Almost involuntarily, only to put an end to it, his finger felt for the button of the electric bell in the anteroom. As he pressed it, he glanced up to the clock. It was eleven o'clock, two hours. He had spent a great deal of his costly time just dreaming, and his wits were, of course, even more dulled than they had been before. But the time had nonetheless not been wasted. He had come to some decisions that could be of value. As well as various pieces of mail, the servitors brought two visiting cards from gentlemen who had already been waiting for Kay for some time. They were actually very important clients of the bank, who should not really have been kept waiting under any circumstances. Why had they come at such an awkward time? And why, the gentleman on the other side of the closed door seemed to be asking, was the industrious Kay using up the best business time for his private affairs? Tired from what had gone before, and tired in anticipation of what was to follow, Kay stood up to receive the first of them. 
He was a short, jolly man, a manufacturer who Kay knew well. He apologised for disturbing Kay at some important work, and Kay, for his part, apologised for having kept the manufacturer waiting for so long. But even this apology was spoken in such a mechanical way, and with such false intonation, that the manufacturer would certainly have noticed if he had not been fully preoccupied with his business affairs. Instead, he hurriedly pulled calculations and tables out from all his pockets, spread them out in front of Kay, explained several items, corrected a little mistake in the arithmetic that he noticed as he quickly glanced over it all, and reminded Kay of a similar piece of business he'd concluded with him about a year before, mentioning in passing that this time there was another bank spending great effort to get his business, and finally stopped speaking in order to learn Kay's opinion on the matter. And Kay had indeed, at first, been closely following what the manufacturer was saying. He too was aware of how important this deal was, but unfortunately it did not last. He soon stopped listening, nodded at each of the manufacturer's louder exclamations for a short while, but eventually he stopped doing even that and did no more than stare at the bald head bent over the papers, asking himself when the manufacturer would finally realise that everything he was saying was useless. When he did stop talking, Kay really thought at first that this was so that he would have the chance to confess that he was incapable of listening. Instead, seeing the anticipation on the manufacturer's face, obviously ready to counter any objections made, he was sorry to realise that the business discussion had to be continued. So he bent his head as if he'd been given an order and began slowly to move his pencil over the papers. Now and then he would stop and stare at one of the figures. The manufacturer thought there must be some objection. Perhaps his figures weren't really sound. Perhaps they weren't the decisive issue. Whatever he thought, the manufacturer covered the papers with his hand and began once again, moving very close to Kay, to explain what the deal was all about. It is difficult, said Kay, pursing his lips. The only thing that could offer him any guidance were the papers, and the manufacturer had covered them from his view, so he just sank back against the arm of the chair. Even when the door of the manager's office opened and revealed, not very clearly, as if through a veil, the deputy director, he did no more than look up weakly. Kay thought no more about the matter. He clearly watched the immediate effect of the deputy director's appearance, and for him, the effect was very pleasing. The manufacturer immediately jumped up from his seat and hurried over to meet the deputy director, although Kay would have liked to make him ten times livelier, as he feared the deputy director might disappear again. He need not have worried. The two gentlemen met each other, shook each other's hand and went together over to Kay's desk. The manufacturer said he was sorry to find the chief clerk so little inclined to do business, pointing to Kay, who, under the view of the deputy director, had bent back down over the papers. As the two men leant over the desk and the manufacturer made some effort to gain and keep the deputy director's attention, Kay felt as if they were much bigger than they really were, and that their negotiations were about him. Carefully and slowly turning his eyes upwards, he tried to learn what was taking place above him, took one of the papers from his desk and, without looking to see what it was, lay it on the flat of his hand and raised it slowly up as he rose up to the level of the two men himself. He had no particular plan in mind as he did this, but merely felt this was how he would act if only he had finished preparing that great document that was to remove his burden entirely. The deputy director had been paying all his attention to the conversation and did no more than to glance at the paper. He did not read what was written on it at all, as what was important for the chief clerk was not important for him. He took it from Kay's hand, saying, "'Thank you, I'm already familiar with everything,' and lay it calmly back on the desk. Kay gave him a bitter sideways look, but the deputy director did not notice this at all, or if he did notice it, it only raised his spirits. He frequently laughed out loud, one time he clearly embarrassed the manufacturer when he raised an objection in a witty way, but drew him immediately back out of his embarrassment by commenting adversely on himself, and finally inviting him to his office where they could bring the matter to its conclusion. "'It's a very important matter,' said the manufacturer. "'I completely understand that, and I'm sure the chief clerk—' even as he said this, he was actually speaking only to the manufacturer, will be very glad to have us take it off of his hands. This is something that needs calm consideration. But he seems to be overburdened today. There are even some people in the room outside who've been waiting there for hours for him. Kay still had enough control of himself to turn away from the deputy director and direct his friendly, albeit stiff, smile only at the manufacturer. He made no other retaliation, bent down slightly and supported himself with both hands on his desk like a clerk. 
and watched as the two gentlemen, still talking, took the papers from his desk and disappeared into the manager's office. In the doorway, the manufacturer turned and said he wouldn't make his farewell with Kay just yet. He would, of course, let the chief clerk know about the success of his discussions, but he also had a little something to tell him about. At last, Kay was by himself. It did not enter his head to show anyone else into his office, and only became vaguely aware of how nice it was that the people outside thought that he was still negotiating with the manufacturer, and for this reason he could not let anyone in to see him, not even the servitor. He went over to the window, sat down on the ledge beside it, held firmly onto the handle, and looked down onto the square outside. The snow was still falling, the weather had still not brightened up at all. He remained a long time sitting in this way, not knowing what it actually was that made him so anxious. Only occasionally did he glance slightly startled over his shoulder at the door to the outer room where, mistakenly, he thought he'd heard some noise. No one came, and that made him feel calmer. He went over to the washstand, rinsed his face with cold water, and, his head somewhat clearer, went back to his place by the window. The decision to take his defence into his own hands now seemed more of a burden than he had originally assumed. All the while he had left his defence up to the lawyer, his trial had had little basic effect on him. He had observed it from afar as something that was scarcely able to reach him directly. When it suited him, he looked to see how things stood, but he was also able to draw his head back again whenever he wanted. Now, in contrast, if he was to conduct his defence himself, he would have to devote himself entirely to the court. For the time being, at least, success would mean, later on, his complete and conclusive liberation. But if he was to achieve this, he would have to place himself, to start with, in far greater danger than he had been in so far. If he ever felt tempted to doubt this, then his experience with the deputy director and the manufacturer that day would be quite enough to convince him of it. How could he have sat there totally convinced of the need to do his own defence? How would it be later? What would his life be like in the days ahead? Would he find the way through it all to a happy conclusion? Did a carefully worked out defence, and any other sort would have made no sense, did a carefully worked out defence not also mean he would need to shut himself off from everything else as much as he could? Would he survive that? And how was he to succeed in conducting all this at the bank? It involved much more than just submitting some documents that he could probably prepare in a few days' leave, although it would have been great temerity to ask for time off from the bank just at that time. It was a whole trial, and there was no way of seeing how long it might last. This was an enormous difficulty that had suddenly been thrown into Kay's life. And was he supposed to be doing the bank's work at a time like this? He looked down at his desk. Was he supposed to let people in to see him and go into negotiations with them at a time like this, while his trial trundled on, while the court officials upstairs in the attic room sat looking at the papers for this trial? Should he be worrying about the business of the bank? Did this not seem like a kind of torture, acknowledged by the court, connected with the trial, and which followed him around? And is it likely that anyone in the bank, when judging his work, would take any account of his peculiar situation? No one and never. There were those who knew about his trial, although it was not quite clear who knew about it or how much, but he hoped rumours had not yet reached as far as the deputy director, otherwise he would obviously soon find a way of making use of it to harm Kay. He would show neither comradeship nor humanness. And what about the director? It was true that he was well disposed towards Kay, and as soon as he heard about the trial he would probably try to do everything he could to make it easier for him, but he would certainly not devote himself to it. Kay at one time had provided the counterbalance to what the deputy director said, but the director was now coming more and more under his influence. And the deputy director would also exploit the weakened condition of the director to strengthen his own position. So what could Kay hope for? Maybe considerations of this sort weakened his power of resistance, but it was still necessary not to deceive oneself and to see everything as clearly as it could be seen at that moment. For no particular reason, just to avoid returning to his desk for a while, he opened the window. It was difficult to open, and he had to turn the handle with both his hands. Then, through the whole height and breadth of the window, the mixture of fog and smoke was drawn into the room, filling it with a slight smell of burning. A few flakes of snow were blown in with it. "'It's a horrible autumn,' said the manufacturer, who had come into the room unnoticed after seeing the deputy director, and now stood behind Kay. 
Kay nodded and looked uneasily at the manufacturer's briefcase, from which he would now probably take the papers and inform Kay of the result of his negotiations with the deputy director. However, the manufacturer saw where Kay was looking, knocked on his briefcase and, without opening it, said, "'You'll be wanting to hear how things turned out. I've already got the contract in my pocket. Almost. He's a charming man, your deputy director. He's got his dangers, though.' He laughed as he shook Kay's hand and wanted to make him laugh with him, but to Kay it once more seemed suspicious that the manufacturer did not want to show him the papers and saw nothing about his comments to laugh at. "'Chief Clark, said the manufacturer, "'I expect the weather's been affecting your mood, has it not? "'You're looking so worried today.' "'Yes,' said Kay, raising his hand and holding the temple of his head. "'Headaches, worries in the family.' Oh, "'Quite right,' said the manufacturer, who was always in a hurry "'and could never listen to anyone for very long. "'Everyone has his cross to bear.' Kay had unconsciously made a step towards the door "'as if wanting to show the manufacturer out, "'but the manufacturer said, "'Chief Clark, there's something else I'd like to mention to you. "'I'm very sorry if it's something that'll be a burden to you "'today of all days, but I've been to see you twice already lately, "'and each time I forgot all about it. "'If I delay it any longer, it might well lose its point altogether. "'That would be a pity, as I think what I've got to say does have some value.' "'Before Kay had the time to answer, the manufacturer came up close to him, "'tapped his knuckle lightly on his chest and said quietly, You've got a trial going on, haven't you? Kay stepped back and immediately exclaimed, That's what the deputy director's been telling you. No, no, said the manufacturer. How would the deputy director know about it? And what about you? asked Kay, already more in control of himself. I hear things about the court here and there, said the manufacturer, and that even applies to what it is that I wanted to tell you about. "'There are so many people who have connections with the court,' said Kay, with lowered head, and he led the manufacturer over to his desk. They sat down where they had been before, and the manufacturer said, "'I'm afraid it's not very much that I've got to tell you about. Only, in matters like this, it's best not to overlook the tiniest details. Besides, I really want to help you in some way, however modest my help might be. We've been good business partners up till now, haven't we? Well, then.' Kay wanted to apologise for his behaviour in the conversation earlier that day, but the manufacturer would tolerate no interruption, shoved his briefcase up high in his armpit to show that he was in a hurry, and carried on. "'I know about your case through a certain Titorelli. He's a painter. Titorelli's just his artistic name. I don't even know what his real name is. He's been coming to me in my office for years from time to time, and brings little pictures with him, which I buy more or less just for the sake of charity, as he's hardly more than a beggar. And they're nice pictures, too, moorland landscapes, and that sort of thing. We both got used to doing business in this way, and it always went smoothly. Only one time, these visits became a bit too frequent. I began to tell him off for it. We started talking, and I became interested how it was that he could earn a living just by painting— and then I learned to my amazement that his main source of income was painting portraits. "'I work for the court,' he said. "'What court?' said I. And that's when he told me about the court. I'm sure you can imagine how amazed I was at being told all this. Ever since then, I learn something new about the court every time he comes to visit, and so, little by little, I get to understand something of how it works. Anyway, Titarelli talks a lot, and I often have to push him away, not only because he's bound to be lying, but also, most of all, because a businessman like me, who's already close to breaking point under the weight of his own business worries, can't pay too much attention to other people's. But all that's just by the by. Perhaps... This is what I've been thinking. Perhaps Titarelli might be able to help you in some small way. He knows a lot of judges, and even if he can't have much influence himself, he can give you some advice about how to get some influential people on your side. And even if this advice doesn't turn out to make all the difference, I still think it'll be very important once you've got it. You're nearly a lawyer yourself. That's what I always say, Mr. K. The chief clerk is nearly a lawyer. Oh, I'm sure this trial of yours will turn out all right. So do you want to go and see Titarelli, then? If I ask him to, he'll certainly do everything he possibly can. I really do think you ought to go. It needn't be today, of course, just sometime, when you get the chance. And anyway, I want to tell you this too. You don't actually have to go and see Titarelli. This advice from me doesn't place you under any obligation at all. No, if you think you can get by without Titarelli. It'll certainly be better to leave him completely out of it. 
Maybe you've already got a clear idea of what you're doing, and Titarelli could upset your plans. No, if that's the case, then of course you shouldn't go there under any circumstances. And certainly it won't be easy to take advice from a lad like that. Still, it's up to you. Here's the letter of recommendation, and here's the address. Disappointed, Kay took the letter and put it in his pocket. Even at best, the advantage he might derive from this recommendation was incomparably smaller than the damage that lay in the fact of the manufacturer knowing about his trial, and that the painter was spreading the news about. It was all he could manage to give the manufacturer, who was already on his way to the door, a few words of thanks. "'I'll go there,' he said as he took his leave of the manufacturer at the door." Or, as I'm very busy at present, I'll write to him. Perhaps he would like to come to me in my office sometime. I was sure you'd find the best solution, said the manufacturer, although I had thought you'd prefer to avoid inviting people like this Titarelli to the bank and talking about the trial here. And it's not always a good idea to send letters to people like Titarelli. You don't know what might happen to them. But you're bound to have thought everything through, and you know what you can and can't do. Kay nodded and accompanied the manufacturer on through the anteroom. But despite seeming calm on the outside, he was actually very shocked. He had told the manufacturer he would write to Titarelli, only to show him in some way that he valued his recommendations and would consider the opportunity to speak with Titarelli without delay. But if he had thought Titarelli could offer any worthwhile assistance, he would not have delayed. But it was only the manufacturer's comment that made Kay realise what dangers that could lead to. Was he really able to rely on his own understanding so little? If it was possible that he might invite a questionable character into the bank with a clear letter and ask advice from him about this trial, separated from the deputy director by no more than a door, was it not possible or even very likely that there were also other dangers he had failed to see or that he was even running towards? There was not always someone beside him to warn him. And just now, just when he would have to act with all the strength he could muster, now a number of doubts of a sort he had never before known had presented themselves and affected his own vigilance. The difficulties he had been feeling in carrying out his office work, were they now going to affect the trial too? Now, at least, he found himself quite unable to understand how he could have intended to write to Titarelli and invite him into the bank. He shook his head at the thought of it once more as the servitor came up beside him and drew his attention to the three gentlemen who were waiting on a bench in the anteroom. They had been waiting to see Kay for a long time. Now that the servitor was speaking with Kay, they had stood up and each of them wanted to make use of the opportunity to see Kay before the others. It had been negligent of the bank to let them waste their time here in the waiting room, but none of them wanted to draw attention to this. "'Mr Kay,' one of them was saying, but Kay had told the servitor to fetch his winter coat and said to the three of them, as the servitor helped him to put it on, "'Please forgive me, gentlemen. I'm afraid I have no time to see you at present. Please do forgive me, but I have some urgent business to settle and have to leave straight away. You've already seen yourselves how long I've been delayed. Would you be so kind as to come back tomorrow, or sometime? Or perhaps we could settle your affairs by telephone? Or perhaps you would like to tell me now, briefly, what it's about?' and I can then give you a full answer in writing. Whatever, the best thing will be for you to come here again. The gentlemen now saw that their wait had been totally pointless, and these suggestions of Kay's left them so astounded that they looked at each other without a word. That's agreed then, is it? asked Kay, who had turned towards the servitor, bringing him his hat. Through the open door of Kay's office, they could see that the snowfall outside had become much heavier, so Kay turned the collar of his coat up and buttoned it up high under his chin. Just then, the deputy director came out of the adjoining room, smiled as he saw Kay negotiating with a gentleman in his winter coat, and asked, "'Are you about to go out?' "'Yes,' said Kay, standing more upright. "'I have to go out on some business.' The deputy director had already turned towards the gentleman. "'And what about these gentlemen?' he asked. "'I think they've already been waiting quite a long time.' "'We've already come to an understanding,' said Kay." But now the gentlemen could be held back no longer. They surrounded Kay and explained that they would not have been waiting for hours if it had not been about something important that had to be discussed now at length and in private. The deputy director listened to them for a short while. He also looked at Kay as he held his hat in his hand, cleaning the dust off of it here and there, and he said, "'Gentlemen, there is a very simple way to solve this. If you would prefer it, I'll be very glad to take over these negotiations instead of the chief clerk. Your business does, of course, need to be discussed without delay. We are businessmen like yourselves and know the value of a businessman's time. 
Would you like to come this way? And he opened the door leading to the anteroom of his own office. The deputy director seemed very good at appropriating everything that Kay was now forced to give up. But was Kay not giving up more than he absolutely had to, by running off to some unknown painter with, as he had to admit, very little hope of any vague benefit, his renown was suffering damage that could not be repaired. It would probably be much better for him to take off his winter coat and, at the very least, try to win back the two gentlemen who were certainly still waiting in the next room. If Kay had not then glimpsed the deputy director in his office, looking for something from his bookshelves as if they were his own, he would probably even have made the attempt. As Kay, somewhat agitated, approached the door, the deputy director called out, "'Oh, you've still not left.' He turned his face toward him. Its many deep folds seemed to show strength rather than age, and immediately began once more to search. "'I'm looking for a copy of a contract,' he said, "'which this gentleman insists you must have. Could you help me look for it, do you think?' Kay made a step forward, but the deputy director said, "'Oh, thank you. I've already found it.' And with a big package of papers, which certainly must have included many more documents than just the copy of the contract, he turned and went back into his own office. "'I can't deal with him right now,' Kay said to himself, "'but once my personal difficulties have been settled, then he'll certainly be the first to get the effect of it, and he certainly won't like it.' Slightly calmed by these thoughts, Kay gave the servitor, who had already long been holding the door to the corridor open for him, the task of telling the director, when he was able, that Kay was going out of the bank on a business matter. As he left the bank, he felt almost happy at the thought of being able to devote more of himself to his own business for a while. He went straight to the painter, who lived in an outlying part of town which was very near the court offices, although this area was even poorer, the houses were darker, the streets were full of dirt that slowly blew about over the half-melted snow. In the great gateway to the building where the painter lived, only one of the two doors was open. A hole had been broken open in the wall by the other door, and as Kay approached it, a repulsive yellow steaming liquid shot out causing some rats to scurry away into the nearby canal. Down by the staircase there was a small child lying on its belly crying, but it could hardly be heard because of the noise from a metal workshop on the other side of the entrance hall, drowning out any other sound. The door to the workshop was open. Three workers stood in a circle around some piece of work that they were beating with hammers. A large tin plate hung on the wall, casting a pale light that pushed its way in between two of the workers, lighting up their faces and their work aprons. Kay did no more than glance at any of these things. He wanted to get things over with here as soon as possible, to exchange just a few words to find out how things stood with the painter and go straight back to the bank. Even if he had just some tiny success here, it would still have a good effect on his work at the bank for that day. On the third floor, he had to slow down his pace. He was quite out of breath. The steps just like the height of each floor, were much higher than they needed to be, and he'd been told that the painter lived right up in the attic. The air was also quite oppressive. There was no proper stairwell, and the narrow steps were closed in by walls on both sides, with no more than a small high window here and there. Just as Kay paused for a while, some young girls ran out of one of the flats and rushed higher up the stairs, laughing. Kay followed them slowly, caught up with one of the girls who had stumbled and been left behind by the others, and asked her as they went up, side by side, "'Is there a painter, Titarelli, who lives here?' The girl, hardly thirteen years old and somewhat hunchbacked, jabbed him with her elbow and looked at him sideways. Her youth and her bodily defects had done nothing to stop her being already quite depraved. She did not smile once, but looked at Kay earnestly, with sharp, acquisitive eyes. Kay pretended not to notice her behaviour, and asked, "'Do you know Titarelli the painter?' She nodded, and asked in reply, "'What do you want to see him for?' Kay thought it would be to his advantage quickly to find out something more about Titarelli. "'I want to have him paint my portrait,' he said. "'Paint your portrait?' she asked, opening her mouth too wide and lightly hitting Kay with her hand, as if he had said something extraordinarily surprising or clumsy. With both hands she lifted a skirt, which was already very short, and as fast as she could she ran off after the other girls, whose indistinct shouts lost themselves in the heights.' At the next turn of the stairs, however, Kay encountered all the girls once more. The hunchback girl had clearly told them about Kay's intentions, and they were waiting for him. They stood on both sides of the stairs, pressed themselves against the wall so that Kay could get through between them and smoothed their aprons down with their hands. 
All their faces, even in this guard of honour, showed a mixture of childishness and depravity. Up at the head of the line of girls, who now, laughing, began to close in around Kay, was the hunchback who had taken on the role of leader. It was thanks to her that Kay found the right direction without delay. He would have continued up the stairs straight in front of him, but she showed him that to reach Titarelli he would need to turn off to one side. The steps that led up to the painter were especially narrow, very long without any turning. The whole length could be seen in one glance, and at the top, at Titarelli's closed door, it came to an end. This door was much better illuminated than the rest of the stairway by the light from a small skylight set obliquely above it. It had been put together from unpainted planks of wood, and the name Titarelli was painted on it in broad red brushstrokes. Kay was no more than halfway up the stairs, accompanied by his retinue of girls, when, clearly the result of the noise of all these footsteps, the door opened slightly, and in the crack, a man who seemed to be dressed in just his nightshirt appeared. Oh! he cried when he saw the approaching crowd, and vanished. The hunchback girl clapped her hands in glee, and the other girls crowded in behind Kay to push him faster forward. They had still not arrived at the top, however, when the painter up above them suddenly pulled the door wide open and with a deep bow invited Kay to enter. The girls, on the other hand, he tried to keep away. He did not want to let any of them in, however much they begged him and however much they tried to get in. If they could not get in with his permission, they would try to force their way in against his will. The only one to succeed was the hunchback when she slipped under his outstretched arm, but the painter chased after her, grabbed her by the skirt, span her around once, and set her down again by the door with the other girls, who, unlike the first, had not dared to cross the doorstep while the painter had left his post. Kay did not know what he was to make of all of this, as they all seemed to be having fun. One behind the other, the girls by the door stretched their necks up high and called out various words to the painter, which were meant in jest, but which Kay did not understand, and even the painter laughed as the hunchback whirled around in his hand. Then he shut the door, bowed once more to Kay, offered him his hand and introduced himself, saying, Titarelli, painter. Kay pointed to the door behind which the girls were whispering and said, You seem to be very popular in this building. Ah, those brats, said the painter, trying in vain to fasten his nightshirt at the neck. He was also barefooted, and apart from that was wearing nothing more than a loose pair of yellowish linen trousers, held up with a belt whose free end whipped to and fro. Those kids are a real burden for me, he continued. The top button of his nightshirt came off, and he gave up trying to fasten it, fetched a chair for Kay, and made him sit down on it. I painted one of them once, she's not here today, and ever since then they've been following me about. If I'm here, they only come in when I allow it, but as soon as I've gone out, there's always at least one of them in here. They had a key made to my door and lend it round to each other. It's hard to imagine what a pain that is. Suppose I come back home with a lady I'm going to paint. I open the door with my own key and find the hunchback there or something, by the table, painting her lips red with my paintbrushes. And meanwhile, her little sisters will be keeping guard for her, moving about and causing chaos in every corner of the room. Or else, like happened yesterday, I might come back home late in the evening. Please forgive my appearance and the room being a mess. It is to do with them. So I might come home late in the evening and want to go to bed. And then I feel something pinching my leg. Look under the bed and pull another one of them out from under it. I don't know why it is that they bother me like this. I expect you've just seen that I do nothing to encourage them to come near me. And they make it hard for me to do my work, too, of course. If I didn't get this studio for nothing, I'd have moved out a long time ago. Just then, a little voice, tender and anxious, called out from under the door. Titrelli, can we come in now? No, answered the painter. Not even just me, by myself? The voice asked again. Not even just you, said the painter as he went to the door and locked it. Meanwhile, Kay had been looking around the room. If it had not been pointed out to him... It would never have occurred to him that this wretched room could be called a studio. It was hardly long enough or broad enough to make two steps. Everything, floor, walls and ceiling, was made of wood. Between the planks, narrow gaps could be seen. Across from where Kay was, the bed stood against the wall under a covering of many different colours. In the middle of the room, a picture stood on an easel, covered over with a shirt whose arms dangled down to the ground. Behind Kay was the window through which the fog made it impossible to see further than the snow-covered roof of the neighbouring building. 
The turning of the key in the lock reminded Kay that he had not wanted to stay too long, so he drew the manufacturer's letter out from his pocket, held it out to the painter and said, "'I learned about you from this gentleman, an acquaintance of yours, and it's on his advice that I've come here.' The painter glanced through the letter and threw it down onto the bed. If the manufacturer had not said very clearly that Titarelli was an acquaintance of his, a poor man who was dependent on his charity, then it would really have been quite possible to believe that Titarelli did not know him, or at least that he could not remember him. This impression was augmented by the painters asking, "'Were you wanting to buy some pictures, or did you want to have yourself painted?' Kay looked at the painter in astonishment. What did the letter actually say? Kay had taken it as a matter of course that the manufacturer had explained to the painter in his letter that Kay wanted nothing more with him than to find out about his trial. He had been far too rash in coming here, but now he had to give the painter some sort of an answer, and glancing at the easel said, "'Are you working on a picture currently?' "'Yes,' said the painter, and he took the shirt hanging over the easel and threw it onto the bed after the letter. "'It's a portrait, quite a good piece of work, although not quite finished yet.' This was a convenient coincidence for Kay. It gave him a good opportunity to talk about the court, as the picture showed very clearly a judge. What's more, it was remarkably similar to the picture in the lawyer's office, although this one showed a very different judge, a heavy man with a full beard which was black and bushy and extended to the sides far up the man's cheeks. The lawyer's picture was also an oil painting, whereas this one had been made with pastel colours and was pale and unclear. But everything else about the picture was similar, as this judge too was holding tightly to the arm of his throne and seemed ominously about to rise from it. At first, Kay was about to say, he certainly is a judge, but he held himself back for the time being, and went closer to the picture as if he wanted to study it in detail. There was a large figure shown in the middle of the throne's backrest, which Kay could not understand, and asked the painter about. That'll need some more work done on it, the painter told him, and taking a pastel crayon from a small table, he added a few strokes to the edges of the figure, but without making it any clearer as far as Kay could make out. "'That's the figure of justice,' said the painter, finally. Uh, "'Now I see,' said Kay. "'Here's the blindfold and here are the scales, "'but aren't those wings on her heels and isn't she moving?' "'Yes,' said the painter. "'I had to paint it like that according to the contract. "'It's actually the figure of justice and the goddess of victory all in one.' "'That's not a good combination,' said Kay with a smile. "'Justice needs to remain still, otherwise the scales will move about "'and it won't be possible to make a just verdict.' "'I'm just doing what the client wanted,' said the painter. "'Yes, certainly,' said Kay, who had not meant to criticise anyone by that comment. "'You've painted the figure as it actually appears on the throne.' "'No,' said the painter. "'I've never seen that figure or that throne. "'It's all just invention. "'But they told me what it was I had to paint.' "'How's that?' asked Kay, pretending not fully to understand what the painter said. "'That is a judge sitting on the judge's chair, isn't it?' "'Yes,' said the painter. "'But that judge isn't very high up, and he's never sat on any throne like that.' "'And he has himself painted in such a grand pose. "'He's sitting there just like the president of the court.' "'Yeah, gentlemen like this are very vain,' said the painter. "'But they have permission from higher up to get themselves painted like this. "'It's laid down quite strictly just what sort of painting each of them can get for himself. "'Only it's a pity that you can't make out the details of his costume and pose in this picture. "'Pastel colours aren't really suitable for showing people like this.' "'Yes,' said Kay. "'It does seem odd that it's in pastel colours.' "'That's what the judge wanted,' said the painter. "'It's meant to be for a woman.' The sight of the picture seemed to make him feel like working. He rolled up his shirt sleeves, picked up a few of the crayons, and Kay watched as a reddish shadow built up around the head of the judge under their quivering tips and radiated out to the edges of the picture. This shadow play slowly surrounded the head like a decoration or lofty distinction. But around the figure of justice, apart from some coloration that was barely noticeable, it remained light, and in this brightness the figure seemed to shine forward so that it now looked neither like the god of justice nor the god of victory. It seemed now, rather, to be a perfect depiction of the god of the hunt. Kay found the painter's work more engrossing than he had wanted, but finally he reproached himself for staying so long without having done anything relevant to his own affair. "'What's the name of this judge?' he asked. 
I'm not allowed to tell you that, the painter answered. He was bent deeply over the picture and clearly neglecting his guest, who at first he had received with such care. Kay took this just to be a foible of the painter's, and it irritated him as it made him lose time. I take it you must be a trustee of the court, he said. The painter immediately put his crayons down, stood upright, rubbed his hands together and looked at Kay with a smile. Always straight out with the truth, he said. You want to learn something about the court, like it says in your letter of recommendation, but then you start talking about my pictures to get me on your side. Still, I won't hold it against you. You want to know that that was entirely the wrong thing to try with me. Oh, please, he said sharply, repelling Kay's attempt to make some objection. He then continued, and besides, you're quite right in your comment that I'm a trustee of the court. He made a pause, as if wanting to give Kay the time to come to terms with this fact. The girls could once more be heard from behind the door. They were probably pressed around the keyhole. Perhaps they could even see into the room through the gaps in the planks. Kay forewent the opportunity to excuse himself in some way, as he did not wish to distract the painter from what he was saying, or else perhaps he didn't want him to get too far above himself, and in this way make himself to some extent unattainable. So he asked, Is that a publicly acknowledged position? No, was the painter's curt reply, as if the question prevented him saying any more. But Kay wanted him to continue speaking, and said, Well, positions like that that aren't officially acknowledged can often have more influence than those that are. And that's how it is with me, said the painter, and nodded with a frown. I was talking about your case with the manufacturer yesterday, and he asked me if I wouldn't like to help you, and I answered, He can come and see me if he likes, and now I'm pleased to see you here so soon. This business seems to be quite important to you, and of course I'm not surprised at that. Would you not like to take your coat off now? Kay had intended to stay only for a very short time, but the painter's invitation was nonetheless very welcome. The air in the room had slowly become quite oppressive for him. He had several times looked in amazement at a small iron stove in the corner that certainly could not have been lit. The heat of the room was inexplicable. As he took off his winter overcoat and also unbuttoned his frock coat, the painter said to him in apology, I must have warmth, and it's very cosy here, isn't it? This room's very good in that respect. Kay made no reply, but it was actually not the heat that made him uncomfortable, but much more the stuffiness, the air that almost made it more difficult to breathe. The room had probably not been ventilated for a long time. The unpleasantness of this was made all the stronger for Kay when the painter invited him to sit on the bed while he himself sat down on the only chair in the room in front of the easel. The painter even seemed to misunderstand why Kay remained at the edge of the bed and urged Kay to make himself comfortable, and as he hesitated, he went over to the bed himself and pressed Kay deep down into the bedclothes and pillows. Then he went back to his seat, and at last he asked his first objective question, which made Kay forget everything else. "'You're innocent, are you?' he asked. "'Yes,' said Kay. He felt a simple joy at answering this question, especially as the answer was given to a private individual and therefore would have no consequences. Up till then, no one had asked him this question so openly. To make the most of his pleasure, he added, I am totally innocent. So, said the painter, and he lowered his head and seemed to be thinking. Suddenly he raised his head again and said, Well, if you're innocent, it's all very simple. Kay began to scowl. This supposed trustee of the court was talking like an ignorant child. My being innocent does not make things simple, said Kay. Despite everything, he couldn't help smiling and slowly shook his head. There are many fine details in which the court gets lost, but in the end, it reaches into some place where originally there was nothing and pulls out enormous guilt. Yeah, yeah, sure, said the painter, as if Kay had been disturbing his train of thought for no reason. But... You are innocent, aren't you? Well, of course I am, said Kay. That's the main thing, said the painter. There was no counter-argument that could influence him, but although he had made up his mind, it was not clear whether he was talking this way because of conviction or indifference. Kay then wanted to find out, and said, therefore, I'm sure you're more familiar with the court than I am. I know hardly more about it than what I've heard, and that's been from many, many different people. But they were all agreed on one thing, and that was that when ill-thought-out accusations are made, they are not ignored, and that once the court has made an accusation, it is convinced of the guilt of the defendant, and it's very hard to make them think otherwise. Very hard? 
Painter asked, throwing one hand up into the air. It's impossible to make it think otherwise. If I painted all the judges next to each other here on canvas and you were trying to defend yourself in front of it, you'd have more success with them than you'd ever have with the real court. Yes, said Kay to himself, forgetting that he had only gone there to investigate the painter. One of the girls behind the door started up again and called, Tutorelli, is he going to go soon? Quiet, shouted the painter at the door. Can't you see I'm talking with the gentleman? But this was not enough to satisfy the girl, and she asked, you going to paint his picture? And when the painter didn't answer, she added, please don't paint him, he's an horrible bloke. There followed an incomprehensible, interwoven babble of shouts and replies and calls of agreement. The painter leapt over to the door, opened it very slightly. The girl's clasped hands could be seen stretching through the crack as if they wanted something, and said, If you're not quiet, I'll throw you all down the stairs. Sit down here on the steps and be quiet. They probably did not obey him immediately, so that he had to command, Down, on the steps. Only then it became quiet. I'm sorry about that, said the painter, as he returned to Kay. Kay had hardly turned towards the door. He had left it completely up to the painter whether and how he would place him under his protection if he wanted to. Even now he made hardly any movement as the painter bent over him and, whispering into his ear in order not to be heard outside, said, "'These girls belong to the court as well.' "'How's that?' asked Kay as he leant his head to one side and looked up at the painter. But the painter sat back down on his chair and, half in jest, half in explanation, "'Well,' Everything belongs to the court. That is something I had never noticed until now, said Kay curtly. This general comment of the painter's made his comment about the girls far less disturbing. Nonetheless, Kay looked for a while at the door, behind which the girls were now sitting quietly on the steps, except that one of them had pushed a drinking straw through a crack between the planks and was moving it slowly up and down. You still don't seem to have much general idea of what the court's about, said the painter, who had stretched his legs wide apart and was tapping loudly on the floor with the tip of his foot. But as you are innocent, you won't need it anyway. I'll get you out of this by myself. How do you intend to do that? asked Kay. You did say yourself not long ago that it's quite impossible to go to the court with reasons and proof. Only impossible for reasons and proofs you take to the court yourself said the painter, raising his forefinger as if Kay had failed to notice a fine distinction. It goes differently if you try to do something behind the public court, that's to say in the consultation rooms or the corridors or here, for instance, in my studio. Kay now began to find it easier to believe what the painter was saying, or rather it was largely in agreement with what he had also been told by others. In fact, it was even quite promising. If it really was so easy to influence the judges through personal contacts, as the lawyer had said, then the painter's contacts with these vain judges was especially important, and at the very least should not be undervalued. And the painter would fit in very well in the circle of assistance that Kay was slowly gathering around himself. He had been noted at the bank for his talent in organising. Here, where he was placed entirely on his own resources, would be a good opportunity to test that talent to its limits. The painter observed the effect his explanation had had on Kay, and then, with a certain unease, said, does it not occur to you that the way I'm speaking is almost like a lawyer? It's the incessant contact with the gentleman of the court that has an influence on me. I gain a lot by it, of course, but I lose a lot, artistically speaking. How did you first come into contact with the judges, then? asked Kay. He wanted first to gain the painter's trust before he took him into his service. That was very easy, said the painter. I inherited these contacts. My father was court painter before me. It's a position that's always inherited. They can't use new people for it. The rules governing how the various grades of officials are painted are so many and varied, and above all so secret, that no one outside of certain families even knows them. In the drawer there, for instance, I've got my father's notes, which I don't show to anyone. But you're only able to paint judges if you know what they say. Although, even if I lost them, no one would ever dispute my position because of all the rules I just carry around in my head. All the judges want to be painted like the old great judges were, and I'm the only one who can do that. You are to be envied, said Kay, thinking of his position at the bank. Your position is quite unassailable, then. Yes, quite unassailable, said the painter, and he raised his shoulders in pride. That's how I can even afford to help some poor man facing trial now and then. And 
How do you do that? asked Kay, as if the painter had not just described him as a poor man. The painter did not let himself be distracted, but said, In your case, for instance, as you're totally innocent, this is what I'll do. The repeated mention of Kay's innocence was becoming irksome to him. It sometimes seemed to him as if the painter was using these comments to make a favourable outcome to the trial a precondition for his help, which of course would make the help itself unnecessary. But despite these doubts, Kay forced himself not to interrupt the painter. He did not want to do without the painter's help. That was what he had decided, and this help did not seem in any way less questionable than that of the lawyer. Kay valued the painter's help far more highly because it was offered in a way that was more harmless and open. The painter had pulled his seat closer to the bed and continued in a subdued voice. I forgot to ask you, what sort of acquittal is it you want? There are three possibilities, absolute acquittal, apparent acquittal and deferment. Absolute acquittal is the best, of course, only there's nothing I could do that could get that sort of outcome. I don't think there's anyone at all who could do anything to get an absolute acquittal. Uh, probably the only thing that could do that is if the accused is innocent. As you are innocent, it could actually be possible, and you could depend on your innocence alone. In that case, you won't need me or any other kind of help. At first, Kay was astonished at this orderly explanation, but then, just as quietly as the painter, he said, I think you're contradicting yourself. How's that? asked the painter patiently, leaning back with a smile. This smile made Kay feel as if he were examining not the words of the painter, but seeking out inconsistencies in the procedures of the court itself. Nevertheless, he continued unabashed and said, You remarked earlier that the court cannot be approached with reasoned proofs. You later restricted this to the open court, and now you go as far as to say that an innocent man needs no assistance in court. That entails a contradiction. Moreover, you said earlier that the judges can be influenced personally, but now you insist that an absolute acquittal, as you call it, can never be attained through personal influence. That entails a second contradiction. It's quite easy to clear up these contradictions, the painter. We're talking about two different things here. Uh, there's what it says in the law, and there's what I know from my own experience. You shouldn't get the two confused. I've never seen it in writing, but the law does, of course, say on the one hand that the innocent will be set free. But on the other hand, it doesn't say that the judges can be influenced. But in my experience, it's the other way round. I don't know of any absolute acquittals, but I do know of many times when a judge has been influenced. It's possible, of course, that there was no innocence in any of the cases I know about. But is that likely? Not a single innocent defendant in so many cases. When I was a boy, I used to listen closely to my father when he told us about court cases at home and the judges that came to his studio talked about the court. In our circles, nobody talks about anything else. I hardly ever got the chance to go to court myself but always made use of it when I could. I've listened to countless trials at important stages in their development. I've followed them closely as far as they could be followed, and I have to say that I've never seen a single acquittal. So, not a single acquittal, said Kay, as if talking to himself and his hopes. That confirms the impression I already have of the court. Uh, so there's no point in it from this side, either. They could replace the whole court with a single hangman. Oh, you shouldn't generalise, said the painter, dissatisfied. I've only been talking about my own experience. Well, that's enough, said Kay. Or have you heard of any acquittals that happened earlier? Oh, they say there have been some acquittals earlier, the painter answered, but it's very hard to be sure about it. The courts don't make their final conclusions public. Not even the judges are allowed to know about them, so that all we know about these earlier cases are just legends but most of them did involve absolute acquittals. You can believe that, but they can't be proved. On the other hand, you shouldn't forget all about them either. I'm sure there is some truth to them, and they are very beautiful. I've painted a few pictures myself depicting these legends. My assessment will not be altered by mere legends, said Kay. I don't suppose it's possible to cite these legends in court, is it? painter laughed. No, you can't cite them in court, he said. And there's no point talking about them, said Kay. He wanted, for the time being, to accept anything the painter told him, even if he thought it unlikely or contradicted what he had been told by others. He did not now have the time to examine the truth of everything the painter said, or even to disprove it. 
He would have achieved as much as he could if the painter would help him in any way, even if his help was not decisive. As a result, he said, So, let's pay no more attention to absolute acquittal, but you mentioned two other possibilities. Apparent acquittal and deferment. They're the only possibilities, said the painter. But before we talk about them, would you not like to take your coat off? You must be very hot. Uh, yes, said Kay who until then had paid attention to nothing but the painter's explanations. But now that he had the heat pointed out to him, his brow began to sweat heavily. It's almost unbearable. The painter nodded, as if he understood Kay's discomfort very well. Could we not open the window? asked Kay. No, said the painter. It's only a fixed pane of glass. It can't be opened. Kay now realised that all this time he had been hoping the painter would suddenly go over to the window and pull it open. He had prepared himself even for the fog that he would breathe in through his open mouth. The thought that here he was entirely cut off from the air made him feel dizzy. He tapped lightly on the bedspread beside him and with a weak voice said, "'That is very inconvenient and unhealthy.' "'Oh, no,' said the painter in defence of his window. "'As it can't be opened, this room retains the heat better than if the window were double-glazed, even though it's only a single pane. There's not much need to air the room, as there's so much ventilation through the gaps in the wood. But when I do want to, I can open one of my doors, or even both of them.' Kay was slightly consoled by this explanation, and looked around to see where the second door was. The painter saw him do so, and said, "'It's behind you. I had to hide it behind the bed.' Only then was Kay able to see the little door in the wall. "'It's really much too small for a studio here,' said the painter, as if he wanted to anticipate an objection Kay would make. "'I had to arrange things as well as I could. That's obviously a very bad place for the bed in front of the door. For instance, when the judge I'm painting at present comes, he always comes through the door by the bed, and I've even given him a key to this door so that he can wait for me here in the studio when I'm not home, although nowadays he usually comes early in the morning when I'm still asleep, and of course it always wakes me up when I hear the door opening beside the bed, however fast asleep I am. If you could hear the way I curse him as he climbs over my bed in the morning, you'd lose all respect for judges. I suppose I could take the key away from him, but that'd only make things worse. It only takes a tiny effort to break any of the doors here off their hinges." All the time the painter was speaking, Kay was considering whether he should take off his coat, but he finally realised that if he didn't do so, he would be quite unable to stay here any longer, so he took off his frock coat and laid it on his knee, so that he could put it back on again as soon as the conversation was over. He had hardly done this when one of the girls called out, "'Now he's taken his coat off!' and they could all be heard pressing around the gaps in the planks to see the spectacle for themselves. "'The girls think I'm going to paint your portrait,' said the painter." and that's why you're taking your coat off. I see, said Kay, only slightly amused by this, as he felt a little better than he had before, even though he now sat in his shirt sleeves. With some irritation, he asked, what did you say the other two possibilities were? He had already forgotten the terms used. Apparent acquittal and deferment, said the painter. It's up to you which one you choose. You can get either of them if I help you, but it'll take some effort, of course. The difference between them is that apparent acquittal needs concentrated effort for a while, and that deferment takes much less effort, but it has to be sustained. Now then, apparent acquittal. If that's what you want, I'll write down an assertion of your innocence on a piece of paper. The text for an assertion of this sort was passed down to me from my father, and it's quite unassailable. I take this assertion round to the judges, as I know, so I'll start off with the one I'm currently painting. I put the assertion to him when he comes for a sitting this evening. I'll lay the assertion in front of him, explain that you're innocent, and give my personal guarantee of it. And that's not just a superficial guarantee, it's a real one, and it's binding. The painter's eyes seem to show some reproach of Kay for wanting to impose that sort of responsibility on him. That would be very kind of you, said Kay. And would the judge then believe you, and nonetheless not pass an absolute acquittal? It's like I just said, answered the painter. And anyway, it's not entirely sure that all the judges would believe me. Many of them, for instance, might want me to bring you to see them personally. So then you'd have to come along too. But at least then, if that happens, the matter is halfway won, especially as I teach you in advance exactly how you'd need to act with the judge concerned, of course. What also happens, though, is that there are some judges who will turn me down in advance, and that's worse. I'll certainly make several attempts, but 
still, we'll have to forget about them, but at least we can afford to do that, as no one judge can pass the decisive verdict. Then, when I've got enough judges' signatures on this document, I take it to the judge who's concerned with your case. I might even have his signature already, in which case things develop a bit quicker than they would otherwise. But there aren't usually many hold-ups from then on, and that's the time that the defendant can feel most confident. It's odd, but true, that people feel more confidence in this time than they do after they've been acquitted. There's no particular exertion needed now. When he has the document asserting the defendant's innocence, guaranteed by a number of other judges, the judge can acquit you without any worries. And although there are still several formalities to be gone through, there's no doubt that that's what he'll do, as a favour to me and several other acquaintances. You, however, walk out the court and you're free. So then I'll be free, said Kay hesitantly. That's right, said the painter, but only apparently free, or to put it a better way, temporarily free, as the most junior judges, the ones I know, they don't have the right to grant the final acquittal. Only the highest judge can do that in the court that's quite out of reach for you, for me, for all of us. We don't know how things look there, and incidentally, we don't want to know. The right to acquit people is a major privilege, and our judges don't have it, but they do have the right to free people from the indictment. That's to say, if they're freed in this way, then for the time being the charge is withdrawn. But it's still hanging over their heads, and it only takes an order from higher up to bring it back into force. And as I'm in such good contact with the court, I can also tell you how the difference between absolute and apparent acquittal is described, just in a superficial way, in the directives to the court offices. If there's an absolute acquittal, all proceedings should stop. Everything disappears from the process, not just the indictment, but the trial, and even the acquittal disappears. Everything just disappears. With an apparent acquittal, it's different. When that happens, nothing has changed, except that the case for your innocence, for your acquittal, and the grounds for the acquittal have been made stronger. Apart from that, proceedings just go on as before. The court offices continue their business, and the case gets passed to higher courts, gets passed back down to the lower courts, and so on. Backwards and forwards, sometimes faster, sometimes slower, to and fro. It's impossible to know exactly what's happening while this is going on. Seen from outside, it can sometimes seem that everything has been long since forgotten. The documents have been lost and the acquittal is complete. No one familiar with the court would believe that. No documents ever get lost. The court forgets nothing. One day, no one expects it, some judge or other picks up the documents and looks more closely at them. He notices that this particular case is still active and orders the defendant's immediate arrest. I've been talking here as if there's a long delay between apparent acquittal and re-arrest. That is quite possible, and I do know of cases like that, but it's just as likely that the defendant goes home after he's been acquitted and finds someone there waiting to re-arrest him. Then, of course, his life as a free man is at an end. And does the trial start over again? asked Kay, finding it hard to believe. The trial will always start over again, said the painter, but there is, once again, as before, the possibility of getting an apparent acquittal. Once again, the accused has to muster all his strength and mustn't give up. The painter said that last phrase possibly as a result of the impression that Kay, whose shoulders had dropped somewhat, gave on him. But to get a second acquittal, asked Kay, as if in anticipation of further revelations by the painter, is that not harder to get than the first time? Uh, as far as that's concerned, answered the painter, there's nothing you can say for certain. You mean, do you, that the second arrest would have an adverse influence on the judge and the verdict he passes on the defendant? That's not how it happens. When the acquittal is passed, the judges are already aware that re-arrest is likely, so when it happens it has hardly any effect. But there are countless other reasons why the judge's mood and their legal acumen in the case can be altered, and efforts to obtain the second acquittal must therefore be suited to the new conditions, and generally just as vigorous as the first. But this second acquittal will again not be final, said Kay, shaking his head. Of course not, said the painter. The second acquittal is followed by the third arrest, the third acquittal by the fourth arrest, and so on. That is what is meant by the term apparent acquittal. Kay was silent. You 
clearly don't think an apparent acquittal offers much advantage, said the painter. Perhaps deferment would suit you better. Would you like me to explain what deferment is about? Kay nodded. The painter had leant back and spread himself out in his chair. His nightshirt was wide open. He had pushed his hand inside and was stroking his breast and his sides. Deferment, said the painter, looking vaguely in front of himself for a while, as if trying to find a perfectly appropriate explanation. Deferment consists of keeping proceedings permanently in their earliest stages. To do that, the accused and those helping him need to keep in continuous personal contact with the court, especially those helping him. I repeat, this doesn't require so much effort as getting an apparent acquittal, but it probably requires a lot more attention. You must never let the trial out of your sight. You have to go and see the appropriate judge at regular intervals, as well as when something in particular comes up. And whatever you do, you have to try and remain friendly with him. If you don't know the judge personally, you have to influence him through the judges you do know, and you have to do it without giving up on the general discussions. As long as you don't fail to do any of these things, you can be reasonably sure the trial won't get past its first stages. The trial doesn't stop, but the defense defendant is almost as certain of avoiding conviction as if he'd been acquitted. Compared with an apparent acquittal, deferment has the advantage that the defendant's future is less uncertain. He's safe from the shock of being suddenly rearrested and doesn't need to fear the exertions and stress involved in getting an apparent acquittal just when everything else in his life would make it most difficult. Deferment does have certain disadvantages of its own, though, too, and they shouldn't be underestimated. I don't mean by this that the defendant is never free. He's never free in the proper sense of the word with an apparent acquittal, either. But there's another disadvantage. Proceedings can't be prevented from moving forward unless there are some at least ostensible reasons given. So something needs to seem to be happening when looked at from the outside. This means that from time to time various injunctions have to be obeyed, the accused has to be questioned, investigations have to take place and so on. The trial's been artificially constrained inside a tiny circle and it has to be continually spun round within it. And that, of course, brings with it certain unpleasantness for the accused. Although you shouldn't imagine they're all that bad. All of this is just for show. The interrogations, for instance, they're only very short. If you ever don't have the time or don't feel like going to them, you can offer an excuse. With some judges, you can even arrange the injunctions together a long time in advance. In essence, all it means is that, as the accused, you have to report to the judge from time to time. Even while the painter was speaking those last words, Kay had laid his coat over his arm and had stood up. Immediately from outside the door, there was a cry of, "'He's standing up now! Are you leaving already?' asked the painter, who had also stood up. "'It must be the air that's driving you out. I'm very sorry about that. There's still a lot I need to tell you. I had to put everything very briefly, but I hope at least it was all clear.' Oh, yes, said Kay, whose head was aching from the effort of listening. Despite this affirmation, the painter summed it all up once more, as if he wanted to give Kay something to console him on his way home. Both have in common that they prevent the defendant being convicted, he said. But they also prevent his being properly acquitted, said Kay quietly, as if ashamed to acknowledge it. You've got it, in essence, said the painter quickly. Kay placed his hand on his winter overcoat, but could not bring himself to put it on. Most of all, he would have liked to pack everything together and run out to the fresh air. Not even the girls could induce him to put his coat on, even though they were already loudly telling each other that he was doing so. The painter still had to interpret Kay's mood in some way, so he said, I expect you've deliberately avoided deciding between my suggestions yet. That's good. I would even have advised you against making a decision straight away. There's no more than a hair's breadth of difference between the advantages and the disadvantages. Everything has to be carefully weighed up. But the most important thing is you shouldn't lose too much time. I'll come back here again soon, said Kay, who had suddenly decided to put his frock coat on, threw his overcoat over his shoulder and hurried over to the door behind which the girls now began to scream. Kay thought he could even see the screaming girls through the door. "'Well, you have to keep your word,' said the painter, who had not followed him. "'Otherwise, I'll come to the bank to ask about it myself.' "'Will you open the door for me?' said Kay, pulling at the handle, which, as he noticed from the resistance, was being held tight by the girls on the other side. 
Do you want to be bothered by the girls? asked the painter. It's better if you use the other way out, he said, pointing to the door behind the bed. Kay agreed to this and jumped back to the bed, but instead of opening that door, the painter crawled under the bed and from underneath it asked Kay, Just a moment more, would you not like to see a picture I could sell to you? Kay did not want to be impolite. The painter really had taken his side and promised to help him more in the future, and because of Kay's forgetfulness, there had been no mention of any payment for the painter's help, so Kay could not turn him down now, and allowed him to show him the picture, even though he was quivering with impatience to get out of the studio. From under the bed, the painter withdrew a pile of unframed paintings. They were so covered in dust that when the painter tried to blow it off the one on the top, the dust swirled around in front of Kay's eyes, robbing him of breath for some time. Uh, "'Moorland landscapes,' said the painter, passing the picture to Kay. It showed two sickly trees, well separated from each other in dark grass. In the background there was a multicoloured sunset. Um, "'That's nice,' said Kay. "'I'll buy it.' Kay expressed himself in this curt way without any thought, so he was glad that the painter did not take this amiss and picked up a second painting from the floor. "'This is a counterpart to the first picture,' said the painter." Perhaps it had been intended as a counterpart, but there was not the slightest difference to be seen between it and the first picture. There were the trees, there was the grass, there the sunset, but this was of little importance to Kay. They are beautiful landscapes, he said. I'll buy them both and hang them in my office. You seem to like this subject, said the painter, picking up a third painting. Good job, I've still got another similar picture here. The picture, though, was not similar. Rather, it was exactly the same moorland landscape. The painter was fully exploiting this opportunity to sell off his old pictures. I'll take this one too, said Kay. How much do the three paintings cost? Well, we can talk about that next time, said the painter. You're in a hurry now and we'll still be in contact. And besides, I'm glad you like the paintings. I'll give you all the paintings I've got down here. They're all moorland landscapes. I've painted a lot of moorland landscapes. A lot of people don't like that sort of picture because they're too gloomy, but there are others, and you're one of them, who love gloomy themes. But Kay was not in the mood to hear about the professional expertise of this painter-come-beggar. Wrap them all up, he called out, interrupting the painter as he was speaking. My servant will come to fetch them in the morning. Oh, there's no need for that, said the painter. I expect I can find a porter for you who can go with you now. And at last he leant over the bed and unlocked the door. Just... "'Step on the bed. Don't worry about that,' said the painter. "'That's what everyone does who comes in here.' Even without this invitation, Kay had shown no compunction in already placing his foot in the middle of the bed covers. Then he looked out through the open door and drew his foot back again. "'What is that?' he asked the painter. "'What are you so surprised at?' he asked, surprised in his turn. "'Those are court offices.' Didn't you know there are court offices here? There are court offices in almost every attic. Why should this building be any different? Even my studio is actually one of the court offices, but the court put it at my disposal. It was not so much finding court offices even here that shocked Kay. He was mainly shocked at himself, at his own naivety in court matters. It seemed to him that one of the most basic rules governing how a defendant should behave was always to be prepared, never allow surprises, never to look unsuspecting to the right when the judge stood beside him to his left. And this was the very basic rule that he was continually violating. A long corridor extended in front of him. Air blew in from it, which, compared with the air in the studio, was refreshing. There were benches set along each side of the corridor, just as in the waiting room for the office he went to himself. There seemed to be precise rules governing how offices should be equipped. There did not seem to be many people visiting the offices that day. There was a man there, half sitting, half laying. His face was buried in his arm on the bench, and he seemed to be sleeping. Another man was standing in the half-dark at the end of the corridor. Kay now climbed over the bed. The painter followed him with the pictures. They soon came across a servant of the court. Kay was now able to recognise all the servants of the court from the gold buttons they wore on their civilian clothes below the normal buttons, and the painter instructed him to go with Kay, carrying the pictures. Kay staggered more than he walked, his handkerchief pressed over his mouth. They had nearly reached the exit when the girls stormed in on them, so Kay had not been able to avoid them. They had clearly seen that the second door of the studio had been opened and had gone round to impose themselves on him from this side. 
I can't come with you any further, called out the painter with a laugh as the girls pressed in. Goodbye, and don't hesitate too long. Kay did not even look around at him. Once on the street, he took the first cab he came across. He now had to get rid of the servant, whose gold button continually caught his eye, even if it caught no one else's. As a servant, the servant of the court was going to sit on the coach box, but Kay chased him down from there. It was already well into the afternoon when Kay arrived in front of the bank. He would have liked to leave the pictures in the cab, but feared there might be some occasion when he would have to let the painter see he still had them. So he had the pictures taken to his office and locked them in the lowest drawer of his desk, so that he could at least keep them safe from the deputy director's view for the next few days. And welcome back. I hope you enjoyed episode 8 of The Trial by Franz Kafka. If you would like to support The Well Told Tale, the best way to do that is on Patreon at patreon.com slash thewelltoldtale. There's a link in the description. I'll be back next time with part 9 of the story. I hope you can join me.